Can you click on the PowerPoint? Yes, thank you. Today we are continuing our trek to the Psalms. And we actually have one of the most uh, known or familiar Psalms besides Psalm 23, which is uh, this one, Psalm 51. It's one of those Psalms that is made famous because of David's prayer of confession and repentance after the sin with Bathsheba and uh, Uriah. I mean, he killed, he had Uriah killed and all that. So it's been used by many in worship as a prayer of, of coming for, uh, as a prayer of coming before God in, with a broken heart and repentful heart. So uh, today we'll have to actually use a couple of words who are, that are very, I would say, avoided in many churches in Canada today, North America, I should say. The words are sin and repentance. We don't really use these words that much anymore. We do use them, but kind of like not that much. And it, it is a cultural trend that basically has affected us um, in our country and, and our, our churches because one, we do have a culture of being nice, being polite. And sometimes speaking out against sin is perceived as impolite or you know not nice. So people kind of have a reluctance to speak against sin or even to mention that something is sin. In Canada, we have this idea in the society, not necessarily in the church, but in the society, that feelings trump truth or feelings trump holiness. You know, so I'd rather make sure that your feelings are not hurt rather than tell you that something has to change. Or others might not come to me and say, Adi, that was wrong, because instead of caring more about truth or holiness, they care about my feelings. You see? And not that feelings are unimportant. Feelings are important. And I love this part of Canada, Canada's culture as my, my adopt, adopted country or adoptive country, which one is correct. But when it gets to trump truth or holiness, it becomes a problem. And of course, we, we live in a world and a culture that wants to hide everything that's not nice at all costs just to save face. As I prepared this message, some, a phrase popped in my brain as normally my brain is a, is a collection of useless junk that sometimes brings this thing up to the surface. And there was a song from a band, British electropop band, if you care, um, Depeche Mode, was big in the uh, 80s and 90s. And of course, as a young, uh, young, young teen, I mean, as a teen and young adult, I was all into this. And there was a song I probably sang without even knowing what I'm saying. Uh, and I thought, ah, oh, let me go back. That might, that, might, that might be a good song because it spoke about the policy of truth. And I thought, I, we need policy of truth. We need a policy of truth. Guess what I learned? The song was all about don't say the truth. It is stupid to use a policy of truth. The song says, you'll see the problems. You'll see your problems multiplied if you continue to decide to faithfully pursue the policy of truth. Basically, if you tell the truth, you get in trouble. And uh, we have many teens here. I, I think the youngest is probably, let's see, uh, Samuel. You know, as a teen, I learned that at home, if I tell the truth about anything I do or say or, or think, I get in trouble. So I learned very young to avoid a policy of truth. But as Christians, what do we do? Do we adopt the way of the world or do we adopt a true policy of truth before ourselves and before God in our, in our heart. You know, when we, we, sh we should pray, admit that we need to, and then pray for a restored and clean heart. One of the most psalm, well-known psalms for this, of course, is the one we study today. So let's just jump into it. Let's read the first two verses. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin what is the context if you read in your bibles there's like small under titles under the the number of the psalm that say it was uh, a psalm of david this was to be sang by the assembly it was to the choir master a psalm of david when nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into bathsheba if you know the Second Samuel 11, um, is it 10 or 11, a story where David, as the king, should have gone to war, but he didn't. He stayed home, 
and then he was tempted by seeing this woman on a roof bathing. He wanted her, he got her, sinned, and then even more, got into deeper sins because he wanted to cover his action by killing her, by first getting her husband to um, cover in a way, and then by actually killing Uriah, her husband. So sin begat, begat? Sin begat more sin. And David was deeper and deeper into his, his dirtiness, the dirtiness of sin. And one day, the, Nathan the prophet comes and knocks at the door and tells him a story about someone that said, you know, <coughs> one guy had like a, I forgot, you know, so many sheep, beautiful, but then this one guy had just one sheep. And the guy who had, had a thousand sheep wanted that one sheep and then went and got it. And David got all riled up and said, oh, let's punish that man. And Nathan said something that's so simple and so profound. You know what he said? It's all you know. You are that man. And to his praise, if I can use this word, David repented. Never justified, never excused. He could have had any excuses. Well, it's her fault, right? She was on the, on the roof. Why did she stay on the roof? Why did she bathe on the roof? It's her fault. Of course, he didn't say that. He actually just deeply, deeply repented. And that's when he wrote this psalm. And we, it starts with a plea. Have mercy on me, O God. And this language here is the language of the one who, has, who knows that has no right for the favor he begs for. He has no right for the favor he begs for. And he uses words, you know, blot out, wash, cleanse. He sees the sin as, as, a, as a stain on his heart that is inside and no shower can ever wash that. The blot out is like, Lord, erase this from my record. Wash and cleanse me is the image of a filthy garment. But he comes to God with these words, and make, I hope you don't miss this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Is that Hebrew word has said, I might have used it before, that means steadfast covenantal love. A love that is not changing because it's God's promise, God's covenant of love with us. It's a patient merciful love. And David knows this. He goes to God and says, Lord, I am filthy. I'm dirty. And I cannot clean my score, cleanse myself. Lord, have mercy on me. And not just mercy, but abundant mercy. Just like the prodigal son in Luke 15, David knows he still belongs. You know, this is something that I had to learn in my early Christian years, that when I sin, God is still my God and my Father. As a young and inexperienced and foolish uh, Christian back in 93, 94, I thought that the second I sin, I no, I'm no longer a son of God. And I thought, if, if that's the case, why bother? But then God revealed to me how deep is his love and how wide is his mercy for me and, uh, and taught me to not run, to not run away from him but to run towards him when sin, hap when sin happens. So just like the prodigal son who went with his father's inheritance into foreign lands and spent everything on foolish things and became filthy and unclean, one day he said, I'm going to go back home. And the father, when he saw him, gave him one of those bear hugs that cannot be mistaken. And David knows that's the kind of father he goes back to. He goes to his steadfast love and his abundant mercy. He does not deserve it, he did not earn it, but he knows, he knows it is there for him. But then he does something special again. If I ask you today, what, what is the thing that God does not forgive? What would you respond? I think I asked this question before. 
That is correct, uh, Rudy. The sin against the Holy Spirit is in the Bible. But I actually have a, another opinion on this or, pers or you know, position or point of thought. What is something that I don't think God is looking for when it comes to forgiveness? And I heard Anna whisper, and she said, excuses. Most times, many, I will say not most, many times, we have this tendency when something happens and we do something stupid or we sin, we have the tendency to blame something, something or someone else to just say, it wasn't my fault. And it's typical human. You know the story, Genesis 3, when Adam is confronted by God, he responds simply, the woman you gave me, she made me. You know, so basically it was God's fault and the woman's fault, not Adam's. Not David here. And I pray this is a lesson that we all learn to not look for excuses, not justify our behavior. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. That was dumb. Please forgive me in your abundant love, in your steadfast love and abundant mercy. Please forgive me. David knows. He says, for I know that my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He never forgets it. He never puts it aside against you. Only you have I sinned and done what is evil in their sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Before, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Let's clarify one thing. Yes, his sin affected Bathsheba. His sin affected the firstborn of Bathsheba who died. His sin affected Uriah pretty, pretty severely, I should say, even. His sin affected his, his, own, his own house. As Nathan the prophet said, the sword shall not depart from your house. And death and betrayal was something that just followed in his life. So sin does affect others against us, but sin in its essence is treason against God. Sin in its essence, it is against God and only God. And yes, the sin does affect others. And we can say, I sinned against my wife. Yes, it is correct. It's not wrong. But at its core, it's still a sin against God that affects my wife. And we, not, nothing happened. Okay, don't worry. It was just an example, I think. In his confession, David finds no fault in God's judgment. His sin is staring him in the face. So he admits it's no one else's fault but his, as sin has followed him from his creation, from, 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 his, from when he was conceived. That David does not hide his sin. First step in David was to come before God with a plea as an undeserving sin, sinner, knowing that God has both mercy and steadfast love. Second step was David not hiding or excusing his sin, owning up to his sin and saying, God, against you, only you have I sinned. No excuses, just staring sin in the face, staring sin in the face and knowing it was his fault and his fault alone. But then the beautiful part of this psalm comes in these verses and the next ones after these ones. Behold, you delight in truth and in, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me and Oh, I'm stopping here. David comes here before God with his words. Behold... You delight in truth, and in the, in the inward being, you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Paul no, it's not Paul. David knows that for him, for God, there are two things that matter, truth and wisdom at this point, and David seeks both. But he knows that at this point, he needs renewal and restoration. These two words, renewed and restored, are probably the essence of this, of this psalm. David knows that despite his sin, God can renew him and restore him. And how does God restore him? Purge with, with 
Purge me with hyssop, wash me. And then I want to hear joy, the broken bones rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Lord, may you make me whiter than snow. That's Isaiah chapter one, if I'm not mistaken. This verses six to nine are all about God's work of restoration for the repentant sinner. And that is a good news for each and every one of us here, me included. That God wants to both pursue and restore those who have sinned. He does not, he does not seek to punish or destroy the sinners. He sent his own son to die on the cross so that he could even more pursue and redeem and release the sinners. Purge me, wash me, all these words here. In his brokenness, David appeals to his faithful, to the faithful and steadfast love of God. He goes back, I go back to this, these verses here. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. And then the next steps. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. What's our, some of the most familiar words that we sing, or we used to sing at least. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of, my, of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. A new heart and a renewed spirit. That's what the sinner wanted, and we want as well. A renewed heart a new heart and renewed spirit. Let's focus, let's zoom in for a second also, on, actually on verse 11. I, you probably know that I teach a Bible study on Thursdays uh, to a church in, uh, in Moldova, a church I used to be connected with before I came to Canada. And uh, during our studies there, uh, this question came up actually this, this week about can God take his spirit away from us as Christians? Can we sing that song? There's a song, I think it's called Psalm 51 that uh, we sing or we sang and says, do not take your spirit away from me. You know, can we actually say this as Christians, God, don't take your spirit from me? You know, uh, there is a, something that we need for clarity here. We're talking about David under the old covenant. And what was the ministry of the spirit in the old covenant? If I said this before, but probably not often enough, is this, uh, this three things, for a time, not forever, for some, not for all, and for a specific task. For a time, for some, and for a specific task. And it was the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Spirit with some, for a time, for a specific task. How do we compare this with the New Testament believers? John 14 says, when God, when Jesus goes up to heaven, he will send, or the Father will send to us the Spirit to be in us and with us. Paul again says that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. There's always this, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit is the, what's the word, the um, pay, uh, down payment. The first things that we receive from God before we actually get our full salvation in heaven. So for us now, we all have the Holy Spirit for all times and for everything we need. It is our seal of our salvation and our future. The seal of the Holy Spirit is the seal of our salvation, our future. So how can we read this today? How can we read this and translate it into new covenant language, you know? I like uh, uh, Eugene Peterson's uh, rendition of this verse in his uh, uh, paraphrase called The Message. It says, don't throw me out with the trash or fail to breathe holiness in me. And this phrase, don't please, don't fail to breathe holiness in me. For us, this, we cannot say, God, please don't take your spirit away from me because we know the spirit is always with us and in us. But we know that if we become hard of heart, and hard of hearing. God will work in different ways to, re, to bring us back to, uh, to awake us and to draw us back to him. But definitely he will not take away 
His Spirit as Christians. That is a gift we have from God, and it stayed there with us. But let's now focus on the first on the first of this passage. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's something we, we need to pray, not just when we sin, but like almost like every day. Lord, help me live today with the clean heart you give me as a gift. And Lord, renew a right spirit within me. I want to want what you want. That sounds crazy, but let me say it again. I want to want what you want. I desire to desire what you desire. Help me thirst for you more, for more of you. This is the renewed, uh, renewed right spirit in us, a clean heart. A willing, and I love the way this, uh, this passage ends. Restore to me the joy of, of your salvation. Remember the, those days when you, oh, this is the, the, the waterfall discourse. I'm not going to go there. Remember when you felt sin burdening you and you felt the bitterness of knowing that you've done something wrong and you felt it like a burden on your shoulders. And the second you knew that you prayed, for forgiveness and repented of, repented of your sin, and you, you knew God forgave you, there's a feeling of freedom and, and just like you would walk on the clouds. Just like you've been thirsty for hours and then you, felt, you find a fresh glass of cold water. This is what David finds here. This is what restores the joy of his salvation. When he knows that his God and his abundant mercy and steadfast love has forgiven his sin. He is still a son of God. He is still part of his, he's still at his service, used by God for his glory. A willing spirit, it says here, upholding me, uphold me with a willing spirit. Even this is still the work of God in him and us, alongside the joy of our salvation, the willingness to obey, the willingness to submit, the willingness to pay the cost of our, of our sanctification. Sometimes we do things begrudgingly, if that's a word, I think it's a word, begrudgingly, you know, complaining. But I do pray that we live our life with Christ willingly. Willingly obeying, willingly submitting, willingly paying the cost that needs to be paid as Christians. As a result, it's, uh, I never really made sense of this uh, ending of the psalm before I actually studied this week. Teach, sing, and declare. There are three main words in this, uh, in this final section. Teach, sing, and declare. I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from your from blood guiltiness, O Lord of God, O God of my salvation. My tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Teach, sing and declare. This is a cont contagious passion for God that is manifested in his speech. He's teaching the sinners about God. He knows he was forgiven. He goes back now to others and say, God, guys, our God is awesome. Just like the woman at the well in John 4, that when she met Jesus and she really understood more, not everything, but more about him, she went back to her village and she was like the first evangelist for a whole small town. He wants to teach the transgressor. He wants to impact people in his life. He wants to sing aloud. Singing is so much part of our lives. As a young man, both in high school, singing was singing. We, as guys, we meet for um, cups of barley juice. And, and uh, you know, we just sing stuff like, you know, we're men, just, but we're just singing. In the military, you know how we, I would say how we made time pass and let sorrows just be just um, fade away. We sang as soldiers. We sang so much. We marched and we sang. And the greatest, greatest song, the most loud songs or the loudest songs were the ones we, we sang at four o'clock in the morning as we marched the city. Okay, we could say we are not we're not the only ones awake at this hour. We will awake everyone else. 
knows our intention. For us Christians, singing is so much part of our life. We sing every Sunday, and it's kind of a routine. We have, you know, three songs, sermon, one song, we finish. But these songs are part of our worship. Most of the songs were meant to be sang because when we sing, I don't know, something happens in our hearts and, and brains, and we open up ourselves with this joy or sadness before God. He says, I will sing, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. I will proclaim this in my songs. They will be the focus of it. And of course, it says, my mouth will declare your praise. This is the reaction of a saved sinner, of a forgiven sinner. Praise the Lord. It's like jumping up and down. It's like, yes, God forgave me. Now I can, not, because I, not, not that I'm going back to what I did before. I'm forgiven. I can go back to my stuff. No, God forgave me. So now I want to live my life for him teach others, sing aloud and declare your praise. I know you, don't want, you do not want my sacrifice. Imagine for a Jewish king to say this. Imagine how this came across for a Jewish king when the temple was operational, when the priests were bringing sacrifices, and that was the main focus of their worship life in Israel. He says, I do not, I will not, no, you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. And the essence here is this. Externals don't save you. You can look good in church, but it doesn't matter if you don't, if God, because God sees your heart. You can fool me. You can fool all of us. We can never fool God. Offerings can be brought, but are they what David calls in the second, next verse, verse 18, are they the right sacrifice? Paul, David knew that God is not looking for a sacrifice just to have some, you know, some, you know, barbecued meat on the, on the altar or whatever. He wants the offering of a broken and contrite heart. The right sacrifice is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. What is this brokenness and contriteness? Fancy words a bit. It means you are crushed, crushed by the weight of your sin. And you cannot continue. You just have to give that to God, knowing that he will take that away from you in his abundant mercy and steadfast love. This is the reaction of a restored and renewed heart. Praise and teach and sing. The broken spirit of a repentant sinner and that contrite heart is what God not only not despises, but wants to see in us. You know, what's the opposite of a contrite heart? A proud heart. And that's one of the ugliest things you could see in a church, a proud heart, because it just goes against everything that God seeks to see in us. When lives are heart shattered, when our heart is broken and contrite, then we want more and more of God. And the psalm ends with this. Whoops, are on the screen? Oh, I didn't put them on the screen. I forgot. Verse, <coughs> verses, well, I don't even have them on my notes. That's interesting. Oh, I do have them. Verse 18 and 19. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered to your altar. This is the, the ending of the psalm. And some say this is added not by David, but by the um, returning exiles uh, in the Nehemiah, in the days of Nehemiah. I don't know, maybe. But the key word here is right sacrifices. We want to bring right sacrifices. Go back a couple of verses. What is a right sacrifice? The one that comes with a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. This psalm closes uh, with these words in a way allowing us to see there's a connection between my own spiritual health and well-being and the body of believers around me. My sin affects others. You know, have you thought about this? My sin affects others. You have an infected tooth. Who has an infected tooth? Who has, who had an infected tooth ever? You know, it's just one tooth, who cares? Do you feel happy? You should feel happy because it's just one tooth, right? Yeah, right. Have you ever hurt your, uh, your toe, little toe? 
on the bed frame, you know, walk into a bedroom. It's just a little tough. Who cares? But boy, it puts you in, the tr in so much trauma. You just, I mean, I don't know what you do, but I would just, <clears throat> anyway. As Paul teaches in, in the book of Corinthians, we are a body of Christ. And what I do affects you, what you do affects me. You know, and sin, unfortunately, affects others. It may not be visible initially, but it will affect the body of Christ. It may, be, it may stay hidden, but not to God. And God will continue to reveal this, to pursue us and to seek us and to challenge us so we can bring right sacrifices before God. The ideal church, sorry, the ideal Israel, and you know, for us as a church, is to have a community of forgiven penitents, forgiven sinners. When we all know we need Christ, we all know we need that broken and contrite heart, because otherwise, the, the, the other choice is to have a proud heart, and this is something that God truly despises. How can, we bring, how can we bring light to the world? It's when we together as a church live in God's love, in God's holiness. When we make sin and repentance, words we use often, because we need often to use these words, not problems. You know what? You know why we change from problem to, uh, from sin to problem? You know, I say, um, Emma, has, Emma has sinned. What does that require? If Emma truly has sinned, what does, that, what does that require? That Emma should repent. If I say Emma has a problem, that Emma can get some treatment. It's not her fault. It's outside her. It's not on her. It's not her, pro it's not her fault. You know, it's, it's, it's her problem. But you know what? Just don't worry. It's, it's, you know, it's something that can be excused or just ignored or whatever. Sin cannot be excused or ignored. Sin has to be repented of. And that brings us to our conclusion. Let's admit that we are all a bit like David. As my friend and pastor Lou Ward said, sin is never too far from us. Let's admit this. None of us is that strong, that mature to say we are safe. We made it. And some of us can say that, but probably before God in heaven, not on this earth. But we're all a bit like David. But also what we need to learn from David is not that we, sin is, not, is never too far from us, but also that we belong. We belong to a merciful and loving Father. And when sin is committed, is not there to blot us out, to erase us. He wants to call us to repentance, to blot our sins out and receive us back into fellowship and, and worship with him. David knows he belongs and he appeals to God's steadfast love and mercy. When you pray to God, that's what you pray. we having this in mind, Lord, your abundant mercy and your steadfast love, I need those today. Who amongst us does not know the need to, to go to Psalm 51 and make it ours? Step one is this, admit. Let's admit. Let's not, let's for, pursue, like uh, the Peshmo would say, let's pursue a policy of truth. If, be, you know, for us and for, I mean, be, for us and before God. As if we play games with God, we're just fooling ourselves. If we think we're holy enough and we don't need to seek God in, in, in repentance and with tears and with, we just seek Him continuously. We're just fooling ourselves. But I love the second step. God's love is still pursuing us. We sometimes say that Nathan saved David because Nathan came in twice knocked at the door. Or, I'm assuming he know. I don't know. He maybe rang the bell. I don't know. But twice came to David. But who was Nathan? Nathan? The prophet. Okay. So what is a prophet? The one whom, who speaks for God. The one whom God gave, gives his words and he gives, comes as a messenger of God's words. Who is the pursuer in this case? Was it Nathan? 
or God's steadfast love pursuing David through the prophet Nathan. God seeks the lost and the wayward children. And praise the Lord for his pursuing love. If you feel that you are too far deep in your sins, I don't know you all, but if you feel you're there, I want to remind you today and to have a hope, hopefully have you rejoice in this knowledge that God pursues, if I can say so, with stubbornness, although that's not probably the best way to say it, pursues his wayward children. Christ even came to seek the lost, seek and save the lost. And the last thing, Lord, give us a tender conscience. Conscience has an issue, a problem. I mean, mine, I mean, maybe mine, I don't know others, but it tends to get callous. We tend to get used to certain things. You know, I, we learned stuff like, you know, somebody doesn't like uh, uh, bad words, like movie with, movies with swearing, so probably they watch nothing right now. Others don't like, of course, movies that uh, um, display sexual uh, um, uh, behavior. And we all turn the TV off or whatever we do. We know we're sens sensitive to some stuff or to other stuff. I watch war movies. I like war movies. And I'm somewhat probably uh, less, I, I'm ashamed, still sensitive to, to blood and guts. I still don't like that stuff. But the more we, we stay with something, the more we get used to it. The more we wa wallow, in our sins, accepting them and excusing them, the more callous our conscience gets. Of course, it's just a metaphor because conscience cannot get callous, but the point is we stop hearing its voice. God still keeps knocking, but we stop hearing. And then we need this prayer, Lord, create in us a clean heart. I want to repent, not excuse my sins. Sin and repentance opened the door for God's work of restoration and renewal. He restores us. So let us be thankful for God's grace and the mercy of God. And he renews us. Our past does not define us. God is the one who defines us. And I love this story. And I probably said this here, but I, I just, it just connects too well with uh, this psalm not to say it. Remember the first born of Bathsheba, I, I told you, that child perished. God did not allow that child to live. And then Bathsheba, uh, I mean, David entered again with Bathsheba and she was pregnant again. And she gave birth to another son. And his name was Solomon. Remember the word Solomon, what is the root word of Solomon, of the name Solomon? It comes from the same word as shalom, as peace. David knew because of, of David's words, he knew he has peace with God. He knew God was not angry at him, and he was content with that. He still lived in the consequences of his sins. He still knew that he blew it, and he probably didn't even know that he has a chance to do anything more again. But one day, a knock at the door, and guess who's at the door? Nathan, the prophet. Bathsheba is holding the, the, the new, newborn baby, the, uh, Solomon, and Nathan is at the door. Last time when Nathan was at the door, the baby died. So I wonder what the mom, what, uh, what Bathsheba as a mom was thinking in those moments when again Nathan is at the door. But now Nathan comes in, and I'm just paraphrasing now, you know, so asks, that's your baby, right? What's his name? Solomon. No, it's not. It's not peace with God. That baby's name is Jedediah, beloved of God, God's beloved. Nathan gave David a new name for the son to show him he is not just at peace with God, but he is still God's beloved that he is still loved by his almighty father and he still, God still has a plan for him. His past does not define him. His sins, though ugly, don't define his future. God does that. And if you know David's life, he continued to be a good king towards the ends of his life. He was still Jedediah, God's beloved. 
And I hope that you feel the same thing today, that your sin don't define who you are. As they are forgiven, as you repent of them, God sees you as, as his Jedediah, his beloved. So faithfully pursue a policy of truth. Don't excuse sin, but repent of sin before God in faith, before his abundant mercy and steadfast love. And watch over yourselves, for sin is never too far away. And pray for this, a tenderness of conscience for every day of our lives. David felt dirty. He uses these words, purge me, wash me, cleanse me, blot out. There was a dirtiness in him that he knew no wash, no shower could ever wash away. And that's true. When I sin, I feel the same dirtiness, and I know that there's nothing I can do to get my own conscience clear, my own being clean. But then as David goes to God, to his abundant and steadfast love, David asks God for love and mercy and for a new life, a cleansed life. What I want to end this message with is this. God gave his son as a sacrifice so that you and I today can live a life that, the, that only requires faith and repentance to feel free from the burden of sin, to have faith in Christ, to repent of your sins, and then God's mercy and God's love are abundantly bestowed upon us. Christ's sacrifice was the final sacrifice, and his sacrifice is enough for anything you, you may have done today. David slept with a woman that was not his, that was with a married woman, and then had her husband killed to cover his sin. You may have done less or worse than that. It still doesn't matter. You still, you still need the same repentance before God. You still need the same brokenness of heart and spirit. And you still receive the same words. You are my Jedediah. You are my beloved. Despite his dirtiness, David knew he can breathe, breathe free again because of God's love. And I know that us, all of us, me included, can do the same. We can look at God and say, Lord, you know my sins. Blot them out. I repent of them. I know that this is what you want of me, a broken and contrite spirit. I repent and come to you in faith in Christ Jesus. And then God says to you and to me, you are my Jedediah, my beloved. Let's pray.